Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another photo mishmash. This one being broadcast live September 15th, 2021. Title of the show, All By Myself. Sorry for that little singing interlude. It just happens. It's just me today. And uh, yeah, maybe I wore Steve and uh, David Carr out a little bit too much, but um, I will survive. There was a long period of time where I did this show by myself. Yeah, it wasn't as good, but I still did it by myself. I've got things to talk about. First, I'm grumpy. I am found myself very irritable today. And as I was making my tea, I thought, I think it's because I'm not in Iceland anymore. I'm having Iceland withdrawals. So I did just return yesterday evening from Iceland, uh, feeling a little jet lag. But I have a solution to jet lag that folks who are traveling, if you haven't tried this, I'm going to talk about that. But I'm not going to be grumpy on the show until we start talking about Instagram. So we have that issue to talk a little bit about. Don't worry. If you know already, I'm not going to spend the entire time complaining about Instagram and what they did to me. Uh, we have good stuff to talk about. The Canon R3 is here. Oh, it looks quite lovely. I have not had my hands on it yet, but it really does look like an impressive camera. Its market niche is a good bit smaller than I think uh, the R5 and the R6 are, just price alone, but also size and its capabilities just kind of narrow that down. So we'll talk a little bit about that and how I think it compares to the Sony A1. We'll also talk a little bit about my trip to Iceland and a couple of things that I brought that really made a nice difference in my life. They weren't expensive things. They were things that you could buy, you could bring on a trip with you that I think will make your life a little bit better. And what else did we want to talk about? Oh, I know. The R3 was a big announcement. We're all excited. That has all the bells and whistles. But that's not what Canon announced that has me most excited. They finally have announced some things that make a big difference in the R ecosystem. So we'll talk about that too. Plus we'll review your pictures. It's just me reviewing your pictures. I think it's gonna go pretty speedy. I'm not gonna flip any of them. I'm not gonna turn any of them black and white. So Steve, if you're watching this, that's what you get if you have real work to do and you can't be on my show. I do, I do wanna take a quick moment and say, hi chat. Right here, you're all right here. Thank you so much for joining us, joining me, us being chat and me together. That's how I'm going to play that mistake that I just said. Um, so welcome. Thanks so much for being here. I appreciate it. You definitely do make this show better. Roy is in chat. If you have questions you want me to answer, this is already a relaxed show. But clearly, since I'm in charge completely 100%, it's going to be even more relaxed. I'm going to take breaks to sip my tea. in this lovely mug that Roy provided for me at one point, or I should say gifted. It's a very, very nice mug. It's one of my favorite to drink tea and coffee out of. Another break for sipping tea and coffee. I put up my banner that says, follow me on Instagram, but you can't because Instagram deleted my account. What, really? No, Toby, you'll get it back. It doesn't seem like it. So we'll talk about that. I wish I had a beep button so I could cuss a lot and then beep it out. That would make me happy right now because I would like to cuss a lot. Tell you a funny story from Iceland. Uh, yesterday, I think it was two, two days ago, last full day in Iceland, Steve and I are at lunch. We had ridden the little Renta scooters over there to save Dave McKay money and taxi rides. You know, he reimburses us for that stuff. Steve's scooter was a little low on battery. And, you know, he's a little taller and a little bigger than me. So he was behind me and he didn't like that uh, on the scooter. So we get to lunch and he's stressing about finding a new scooter with a better battery to get him back home. That's what he was stressing about. What am I stressing about? The fact that Instagram deleted my account and it's gone. And I don't know if I'll get it back. So Brian says, hope you enjoyed Iceland, Toby. Hope the volcano wasn't asleep when you were there. That is a great question or a great, um, Comment, Brian, because we went twice. 
because the first time we went, it was asleep. This dang volcano has been erupting and oozing lava since what, March-ish, I think, late March? And um, about a week before we went to the volcano, we were scheduled to go to the volcano, it kind of petered out. We could walk to see where there was lava that had cooled slightly. It was still warm to the touch. Well, that's pretty cool itself. It was smoking in places. That was very cool itself. But there's no juicy orange lava, no hot magma to be found. So when we came back to Reykjavik at the very end of the tour, uh, Steve and I took the opportunity to go back to it because it started erupting again. And I have some pictures. The hike was um, pretty tough to get there. It was uphill for about two and a half miles, parts of it incredibly steep, and it was rainy and windy. And I'm talking wind like uh, like sticking your head out the car window when you're on the highway, 60, 60 miles an hour. If I was When I was breathing hard and my mouth was open like this, you turn a certain way and the wind would start to catch my lip and make it quiver like those dogs that stick their head out the window. It was incredibly windy. People had built these little rock kind of walls up at the very top uh, of the mountain where you could go to see the volcano to kind of see into the crater. Uh, and those were lifesavers. I mean, like literally there was times it was so windy that I was uh, pushed around by the wind. You'd stumble a little bit. And I discovered that if you hiked like this, you presented a little bit less of a target for the wind and um, you could, you know, feel a little more stable. But every once in a while, I'd have to take my hands out because I'd stumble on a rock or something. And then the wind would catch you and you would stumble a little bit more. I'm not exaggerating. It was intense. But then you got up there, you're behind this little rock wall and you were photographing lava spurting out of a volcano. 110% worth it. Absolutely. And even I think if we hadn't seen the lava, uh, it still would have been worth it because one, I get to tell the story now. And two, now I know what it's like to hike in Iceland when the wind is blowing that much. Um, so it's a neat experience to have. I like experiences. And I was talking about this a little bit on, on the trip. Um, I love photography. Clearly, I've made it my living. But there is a part of me that I think uses it as an excuse just to go out. It's not always about getting the pictures. It's about saying, hey, I'm going to go get these pictures. But it's the experiences I have along the way that kind of make it that much, that much sweeter. So, um, yeah couple bits of chat that I'm seeing. I thank you, chat, for uh, reminding me. Penn Photo Enthusiast Network, uh, which I'm part of. And if you're watching this and you're not, you should consider joining photorec.tv slash pen. Uh, lots and lots of people are also PPA members, the Professional Photographers of America, which are currently having their international photo competition, of which a lot of pen members have entered. And so many are doing really, really well. Again, even if you've if you've entered and you didn't uh, merit any of your images, you still learned something and you got feedback. So much like what I'm saying, where I'm going out, it's not always about the photos. Entering the IPC is not always about meriting. It's about the experience and the learning as you go. So uh, congratulations to those who have entered, no matter where you are uh, in the merit number. What do you all want to talk about first? You want to talk about Instagram deleting my account? You want to talk a little bit more about Iceland? Uh, you know, I think it's it's not only that I'm no longer in Iceland that's making me a little grumpy. It's the fact that in Iceland, if you chose to go see a volcano erupting, you could. You could do that. Uh, it's, just, it's just a wonderful country. Every single time I go, this is now my fourth trip. This was a full two weeks in there, uh, a 10 day standard trip. And then some people stayed on for a couple more days, three and a half, four, uh, for an extension into the West Fjords. Every time I go, we're just driving in the bus and I look at this landscape and go, it's just amazing. It's just epic. There are other landscapes in the world that are epic in different ways and gorgeous and beautiful. And I'm excited to see those. I'm excited to go to those places for workshops. But there is something special and unique about Iceland that just really stands out. And the easiest way to describe it is a landscape photographer's dream. I mean, there's just so much content there to be captured 
uh, places to experience and enjoy. And it was just a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. That was my first time fully leading this trip. Um, and uh, that was fun too. It was a lot of fun to be sharing this place with so many people and and to see it through their eyes as well, which was exciting. So um, as, as beautiful as I find Iceland, it is even more interesting, I think, to bring new people there and hear them say, ooh and ah. We saw so many rainbows. I lost count. Over a dozen rainbows. Sometimes the rainbows led to a glacier, like literally. Sometimes they arched over a field of uh, Icelandic horses. Sometimes they uh, connected to a famous landmark or rock. Uh, just wonderful. The one thing I'm not good at, though, is really saying the place names. They are that language. That language is tough. It's really, really tough. So Fran says, stop making me jealous, Toby. You know, you got to come with us. Uh, we'll be back. And I'm I'm really excited to, to be working on some other tours to Iceland, not just kind of our standard 10 day, but some ones that focus on different areas and, and maybe have a little bit more... Um, I don't want to say extreme, but a little bit more adventurous as well. So stay tuned for that. It's not coming anytime soon, but stay tuned. I'd say follow me on Instagram so that you would be updated, but you can't because Instagram deleted my account. Should we talk about that? Let's talk about it, and then maybe I'll stop talking about it. Uh, I'm going to do a video about it because I have some practical information to share about what if it happens to you. And you're out there sitting thinking, it's not going to happen to me. Why would Instagram delete my account? I was sitting there a couple weeks ago thinking that same thing. Um, so the real quick, the real short story, because it's kind of a stupid and boring story. Um, I have a business account with Instagram. They provide analytics that show you followers, gains, losses, you know, where your followers are, what time they're most active, things like that. But it's pretty basic. Uh, and Sigma gave me a shout out after I reviewed uh, their 150 to 600 lens and I used it to make that nice picture in Moab. And I was like that morning that they shouted me out, I was like, oh, let me let me install one of those nice little apps that gives you a good follower count real time. And so I found one on the Google Play Store. It's called like Insight. Good reviews. Scan the first couple of reviews. All seemed legit. I installed it and said, you know, connect to my account and it started scanning. About 15 minutes later, I got a message that said, your account has been uh, disabled. We're reviewing it. I thought, oh, okay. Um, all right. And it said 20, in 24 hours, you know, there'll, there'll be more information, basically, is what the little message said under the login when I tried to log in. It logged me out. Uh, so I was like, okay. 24 hours go by, I try to log back in and it says your account has been deleted for violating Instagram policy. I thought, wait a second. And there is a little link there that says, if you think this is a mistake, click here. You go there, you put in your information, you say you have a business account, and then there's a spot to upload like your professional, your, your business license, tax documents. There's a, there's a little list of things that they say, here's what you can submit to prove that your business is real and this is your account. And so I've submitted that. And then you get an automated email back that says, um, you know, hold up a number next to your face so that we can clearly see the number. It's kind of like that third party or the second second factor authentication, but you have to send a picture of you holding the sign with the number they give you on. And then that's it. I did that and uh, no response. So a few days later, I did it again and just got that automated, hold this number up, send it in, no response. It's now been about three weeks. I'll fill out the form again soon. I didn't do it at all when I was in Iceland because I was busy. Uh, in my mind, so this this app has 100,000 downloads or something like that, all really good reviews. After this happened, I went and looked at the reviews more carefully. Um, and there was one other review that said, hey, after I installed this app, my account got banned and I haven't been able to get it back yet. And I thought, oh, crap. I wonder if I had seen that one review out of, I don't know, there's like 5,000, 10,000 reviews, would I have not installed this app? But there's all of these other people that are happy. What, what, why, what was it? What was it that caused Instagram to do this? 
And here's these are the frustrating things. Um, I, I've been running my Instagram account for close to a decade. I don't remember. I can't go back and look it up and see when the first picture I posted was, but it's been about a decade. I think nine years is, is a safe number to say. Nine years. Never had any issues. Never, ever had any other warnings. Never red flags. Never, you know, you posted a comment that we flagged. Nothing. One thing. And boom, it's gone. And so then I start Googling and reading. How do we get it back? And then if you post that on Twitter, you get all of these responses. Oh, message my friend, Dark Web 69 and he'll help you get it. You know, pay him 400 bucks and he'll get it. No, those I would not give anybody money. What the people in No say is go to Facebook's, you know, ad center, say you want to run an ad on your Instagram account, say, hey, I want to pay money to you guys, but I can't right now because my account's disabled. And they'll be like, and they'll fix it. I never officially connected this Instagram to my Facebook. I didn't have a reason to. I never ran any ads on Instagram. Um, and, um, but I did get a hold of somebody at Facebook. I actually was able to chat with a real person uh, and said, here is my username. I've been banned. It's kind of ridiculous. And they looked into it and, and they basically acknowledged that, yep, you've been banned. I'm really, really sorry. But the only thing I can tell you to do is to fill out that form again. That's all they can do. So that's annoying. And yes, I mean, I'll try to kind of think of a couple of different like analogies of this, but I can't think of any good ones. But I'll just say this. More than I have all the pictures, I didn't lose any pictures. Um, I have a lot of the captions, which for me, when I post to Instagram, sometimes the captions are almost more important to me than the pictures. It, it is kind of a, a diary or journal entry of what I was doing or seeing or thinking or where I was when I captured this picture. And I, I like those. Those are all gone. I have a lot of them because when I write them, I often don't write them directly into Instagram. I write them into uh, Google Keep or sometimes a document, or I have been slowly working on putting together a little photo book and I had collected captions from many of my favorite pictures and I have those in a separate document as well. But there are thousands and thousands more captions that are now gone. That's a bummer. That was a really nice record. Uh, and so my account is just wiped out and there's people that write me through photorec.tv Instagram uh, or have reached out through email or other channel and said, what happened to your account? So it's the, the connections I've built with people and, and the friendships, I call them Instagram friends. There are a lot of people that I interacted with frequently on Instagram that I may or may not have ever met in person, but um, that's all gone. So that's crummy. Kevin says, try calling someday. You can't get anybody on the phone, Kevin. There is a helpline for Facebook and Instagram. But when you call it, they say, if this is about Instagram, go to our website. Yep. And like I said, I got a real person on that I'll, you know, say. And then other people say, well, Toby, you, you are somewhat of a celebrity. I mean, the teeniest, tiniest celebrity. Not enough for Instagram to care. I was never verified on Instagram. 24-ish thousand sub followers and oh well. All right. Let me take a moment and um, look at what you all are saying about that. Lots of tears, lots of tears. Pam wants to know, is it cold in Iceland? You know, honestly, in September, not really. I'd never call it a uh, balmy, but it was never cold. Chilly when the wind was blowing and when it was damp but it's never really cold. Bring a nice jacket, Pam. Stop being a San, du San Diego in. All right. Um, I will say that I've been posting some to Glass. If you follow, if you watch other mishmashes, I talked about Glass a little while ago. That is a competitor to Instagram. I'll put competitors in air quotes because I think they have such a very long way to go. But the idea behind it is that you are not the product. You pay them. Uh, I think it's going to be like $24 a year. And so there's no ads uh, and it's just really nice, high quality images that you're sharing. It's going to be another photo community. But as I said, I think they have a really tough road ahead of them. Uh, the interactions there, the growth seems pretty slow. 
Uh, I am gaining new followers, but not at any kind of impressive rate. So um, I'll be curious to see how that goes. $24 a year really is a very low amount of money um, if it means that I get a place to share pictures where, you know, ostensibly when something goes wrong, I can actually talk to somebody and say, hey, why did this get so broken? So we'll see. All right. Um, uh, GJ Bernard wants to know, if I can't get my IG account back, will you create a new one or look elsewhere social media wise? Um, that's a great question. So I mentioned Glass. Uh, you know, if they do give it back to me, I mean, part of me feels like I don't want to use it. But of course I am because it was probably beyond... Uh, other than YouTube, the the best way for me to reach the greatest number of people with a great frequency, um, a picture, a, hey, a, hey, we're working on a Death Valley tour coming up, sign up here to be noticed. Uh, those would get good traction and good information. It, it was a very, uh, it was a good tool in my arsenal of tools. Um, will I start a new one? <sighs> Probably. Because I just, I said it was useful, but God, you know, I feel like they just punched me in the face and then I have to walk back up and be like, punch me in the face again someday, maybe. I mean, will I ever install one of these uh, analytics tools again? No, I definitely won't. But gosh, it seems crummy. So, uh, yeah, that's what I have to say about it. John, if you're joining us, you just scroll back a little bit, banned for for. I mean, I'm going to say an absolute mistake. I mean, maybe maybe when I gave my uh, credentials to this app, uh, somebody intercepted them and started hacking. But come on, Instagram, can't you see that? Can't you see that all of a sudden? And this is an app that isn't used to buy or sell followers. It is simply analytics. I need to stop talking about it because I'll go on too long. And I and I do want to make a separate video to talk about some useful things. So let's do something useful. Let's take a look at your pictures that you sent in um, to give you some feedback on them. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to open up Lightroom. Make sure that you can see what I'm seeing. All right, looks good. First up, Pam Case, who I just gave a hard time to for being too San, Do San Diego in. She's got a bare portrait. I want to ask you, chat room, what do you notice after you notice the bear? If you said the green, you're seeing what I'm seeing. So we've got this nice bear, but then immediately my eye is drawn off to this little bright strip of green off on the right. A couple of things you could do about it. I mean, the easiest thing you could say is, well, I want to hit the R key to get into crop. And you could just kind of crop in, make this a real tight portrait. I'm going to crop in on the other ear, kind of a similar amount, maybe come down a little bit like that. Now that feels a little tight to me. Here, let's do this. Let's change our background to a medium gray so we can kind of get a sense of where this picture ends. So that's one option, but I don't love it. It's the fastest, but that doesn't mean it's the best. I think another option that is not too much more work is to get a brush, bring exposure and or shadows down and come in here and just brush this green down and make it darker. That's what I would suggest. Now out in the field, when you're capturing this, Pam, I would love for you to look and say, oh, look, there's a little bright strip of green back there. If I step a little to the right or a little to the left, I could hide that maybe behind the bear's head or um, you know, behind some other object that's going to uh, make it seem a little bit less uh, obvious. There we go, we can start to do this. Now, we do lose some of that definition of the edge there, but I think that's much better. And this feels to me like we've just got shadow on the side and it just kind of continues from the darkness back. The other thing that I'll say about this, Pam, is that um, it really feels midday-ish. Uh, just this really harsh, a bluer light on the bear. And if we warm the temperature up, we can help that a little bit, bring the highlights down a little. But really, the real answer is just try to avoid taking pictures of subjects lit in light like this. Now, I know that it's not always possible, but that is going to help really kind of improve 
the pictures uh, that you're capturing if you can uh, wait for the better light or maybe wait until the bear was in the shade a little bit more. Yes, you'd have to have a higher ISO, uh, but that's okay because you'd have this little bit of a softer light on it. Otherwise, really nice and sharp. I love the eye contact, the catch lights in the eye. All very, very nice. Good job, Pam. We're going to move on. Sean has Smoky Mountains. Very nice. I love stream pictures. One of the very first flowy stream pictures. One of the very first um, pictures that I captured that I was super proud of wasn't too much different than this. It's just kind of this long exposure. This is five seconds. So we get this nice, soft water flowing through here. And I just love it. I, I like a little bit of foreground too. What I'm noticing though is we're at f5.6, 50 millimeters. So we're not too far away from here. And we're at 50 millimeters, not too wide either. And what that has caused you is your depth of field is, is shallow. Focus seems to start right about here across the, the third. Let's hit the rule of thirds. So the middle third is what's in focus the sharpest. And I have to say the middle third is not that exciting to me. This up here is exciting, but it's not quite as sharp. This down here is part of the story, but it's not quite as sharp either. This is kind of just like, you know, when you're reading a book and you get hooked, you know, with a good entry and a good opening, then there's the middle that kind of fleshes out the story. And then there's the, the climax towards the end. It's kind of how I feel about this, this picture, um, except we're thrown out a little bit because the beginning of the story, which I'm going to say is down here, or you could flip it and say it's up here, uh, is not as sharp. That's what I'm trying to say. So I would love to see a little bit more uh, careful thought about where that focus point is going to land and how you're going to lay this out. Now, I'm going to assume you're on a tripod because you're at five seconds. Uh, and I would say that you should take time to go up a little bit higher in your aperture. Maybe F8 could give you just a little bit more sharpness. It's not like these are terribly out of focus. They're just a little bit soft. And I would really love to see this area back here be nice and sharp so that it was a really good contrast of sharp rocks against the smooth, flowy water. That's what I would love to uh, love to see a little bit. Composition wise, I, I think we're pretty close to what's what's interesting. Uh, I might just come in a little bit tighter, kind of using this rock up here as our anchor point. And then we've kind of flow in here into this little nice pool of water framed by the rocks that wrap all the way around in this big C shape. The term I use a lot when we are out in the field and we're talking uh, is deliberate. You really want to be very deliberate with your framing, where things are coming in to and exiting the frame, um, where your center point of interest is, and of course, where your, your uh, focus point is as well. We can bump texture up a little bit. You could even try to cheat and get this back by maybe throwing a, a graduated filter over the top with just texture and clarity up to kind of bring that into focus just a little bit more. And you could, of course, use uh, Topaz Sharpen uh, on that area there. Don't use on all because it's going to make the sharper part even more sharper. Your goal is to try to even out that sharpness. But ideally, out in the field, you're going to make those decisions about your aperture a little bit more. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Kevin Walk has got a, I'm going to say a similar picture in that it is water moving. Now, this is a great example of 1 15th of a second giving you the um, kind of a sense of the motion. And this is really a personal preference thing. That's what I would say about this. What do you like to see in your movement of the water? Some people like uh, more similar to Sean's, real smooth. Some people like more like this. I'll say like again. Uh, it's just a little bit more frenetic. Frantic, maybe, would be another way to say it. There is kind of like this energy here, less peaceful than this, which isn't bad. It's just different. For me, I would like to see this just a little bit longer because some of this is a little jarring in its movement and its motion. 
And I would love to see a little bit of a longer shutter speed that's going to allow some of that more jarring movement to smooth out. I don't want to lose all the detail in all of the different places, but some of it, I think, like these little splashes and some of this movement here, just a little bit longer, maybe one sixth of a second or a half a second um, would take us to be a, a little bit more interesting. Other than that, I think this is really nice. This one orange rock with no water flowing over it. I mean, we have that in other places, orange rocks, but they all are kind of covered by water. That, oops, I uh, hit the crop cool. That uh, throws me a little bit. So I think I would come in just kind of starting somewhere in this vicinity here and kind of simplify this picture so that it really is just flowing water. Uh, somewhere in that vicinity there. And then what I would do is paint on a little bit of clarity on the parts of the rock that aren't covered by the water. Again, try to, to you're really kind of uh, emphasizing that crispy rock versus flowy movement water. Nice. All right. And then we are on a roll today with flowy water pictures. This is Delena's Jewels of the Forest. This is a hike in Glacier National Park. You go along this gorge for a while and it's just absolutely gorgeous. I love that we've got these three images together. I didn't plan this, it just happened that way. This is 1.6 seconds. So you can see not that long, but, um, and it does depend on the speed of the water too. So you can take 1.6 seconds of Niagara Falls or this, or maybe what Kevin took a picture of, and you will get different looks um, so keep that in mind. But uh, let's see, she, Delaney, you have this digitally matted. Uh, so I'm just gonna, just gonna come in. The one thing that I'm not sure about that I struggle with a little bit here, well, a couple of things actually. One, it feels like this is a little bit straighter to me. Uh, how am I judging that? Well, I'm looking at this uh, line of water at the very back, kind of making that horizontal. I could be wrong. I'm also judging the trees. Trees don't always go straight, but when you see a couple of them, they can be kind of a good sense of what should be vertical. And also this right here seems at a little bit of an angle as well. In fact, if I felt like I was straightening that, it would be all the way there, which I think is a little too much. But you know what, what, what I like about all the way there? I feel like it can work too. Um, is that we really have the water close to exiting the bottom left of the frame. Gets a little bit closer than when we originally had it posted. Uh, and also by just kind of turning it a little bit, we've cropped out some of that. Th those trunks over there, they just, they didn't add much. I don't think we need much in that corner there um, because those dead branches just take me away a little bit. So I'm going to crop in just a little bit tighter. Uh, we have less of the story, but I think the part we're looking at now has a lot of power. It's a lot of power. And then what I'm going to do is, and you know, I think I think people know personal preference of how bright or dark your image is, how moody it is. Um, I want to see this a little bit brighter. I want to see nice detail. We've got these rocks with uh, cool kind of smooth water-worn shapes. I want to really be able to see those. I'm going to bring up the overall exposure a good bit. I'm going to add a tiny bit of content. I'm going to bring highlights down a little. I want to be careful that we can still see detail. Look, look let's go in here, 1.6 seconds. Look how you can still see the stripes to the water. But I do want to be careful. We have those little bit of a brighter spots there that I want to make sure aren't too bright. So I'm bringing highlights down a little bit. Um, and let's see what happens when we bring shadows up a little more. Yeah. A little bit more. Um, and then what I think you could do is you could also play with the HSL color panel, luminance. Um, you could see about, or no, sorry, saturation. Let's add a little saturation to the yellow, just a little bit, and a little bit to the green. And then let's go to the hue. And what happens if we shift the yellow 
in the direction of green or the other direction. So I just, I like to be dramatic for a moment to see if Lightroom is realizing what colors that I hope it's working with. Does that make sense? So I'm just gonna push some of that yellow towards the green a little bit, plus seven, plus 10. I'm not gonna change uh, the fact that the moss was yellowish, but I just wanna give it a little bit more green oomph. And the last thing that I might do is paint on, I see this little hint of cool turquoise in that part of the water there. And I might paint on a little bit more to exaggerate that. But I think that looks pretty nice overall. So, chat seems to be mostly agreeing with me. Thank you, Delana. That's a beautiful spot. Becky Miller's got uh, Moab stars. She's listing this as a stack edit. So this is something we started talking about on workshops. It's something that I've been doing more frequently with my star photos. And that is anytime you get a shot where you're like, hey, this is great. I'm loving what I'm seeing here. I say take 10 of them right in a row, maybe even at a shorter shutter speed and a slightly higher ISO, and then throw them into one of these specialized star stacking softwares, not for star trails, but for better noise to star um, kind of ratio. And I've been having some really good success with this. The software is pretty cheap and it does a really good job of giving you cleaner images. So that's what I think Becky has done here. And this is, I mean, this is neat because you have this just cool landscape of Moab, Arches National Park is where this is that you're looking at um, window arches, north window and south window. Um, and then of course the Milky Way stretching up above them across this frame and looking quite deliberate, Becky, in how this uh, stretches from the bottom left to right about in the top right corner exits the frame. You know, this is, this is very nice. The one thing that I, that I struggle with is the fact that this also doesn't look level, but I know that this is pretty much how the scene looks. And if you look carefully and you look at the trees, you realize that they are, or the bushes, they are growing fairly straight there. Uh, but I might bring it down just a little bit more to kind of give that sense. And this is also something that you're gonna run into when you're shooting really wide. You get a little bit of distortion on the end. This guy, this this rock here, this kind of taller rock on the right, it does, um, it is a good bit more vertical. But when you shoot so wide, you're gonna have those things out at the edges leaning in. So um, that's something to, to kind of watch for. And it's why I personally find myself cropping in so often when I'm shooting very, very wide, because I'm trying to avoid that distortion at the end. The other thing that I would say about this is you have a lot of stars, a lot of stars. I wonder in your sharpening program, if you, um, there are some, usually some other options. One of them is to not give you quite as many stars because it almost, it almost is taking away from, from the Milky Way here. So I'm going to uh, just crank up noise reduction for a minute and just see how your, how the image responds, because my goal is I want to take away a few of the stars. It might seem funny to say that, but I think we have too many. Uh, the Milky Way is visible but almost overpowered by the number of stars on the left and the right. I'm not really seeing a whole lot of uh, stars disappearing with a noise reduction. Hmm. I wonder if we bring a, a graduated filter down. Let's, let's shrink it in a little bit. Just see, let me see what happens if we bring uh, the noise reduction here up and texture and clarity down a little bit. And let's do the same thing. Let's duplicate this graduated filter. Drag it over here on the other side. Something like this. Again, this isn't necessarily what I'm suggesting in the editing process, more so um, trying to earlier on in the process when you're deciding just how many stars you want to include in this. Let's do backslash to see before and after. You see, it's fairly slight, but I think, I feel that that makes the Milky Way stand, stand out a little bit more, which I think is an important part of this image. Cool. Thank you, Becky. All right, I'm going to move on. Teresa has Sunset Storm. Oh, man. That is some cool clouds and colors over there. It's really, really cool.
Here's what I love about this image. I said what I love about this image, the clouds. Here's what I struggle with. We have a neat story of these clouds off over the, this lake or off in the distance. We have this lake reflecting these colors. We have a boater headed out to enjoy an evening fishing, hopefully not to be um, attacked by this crazy cloud storm. Uh, but that boater in this boat is a little lost in this foreground stuff. And it looks to me, Teresa, that if you had taken four or five steps forward and gotten to the edge of this, we would have a very kind of clean shot of reflection, boat, storm. We say this every once in a while in, in when we're talking about these images. Anything you can do to simplify your image is usually going to be good. When you look at award-winning images, most of the time they're incredibly simplistic in their uh, kind of style and presentation to you. Very, very much so. So that's something to keep in mind and keep an eye out for. If anything you can do to simplify it is going to be better. So that's one thing I want to talk about. Next is when I, uh, let's go up to, oh, that is 100%. So this is a little, a little on the small side on this big screen. Let's go to 200%. I'm noticing just a little bit of haloing around this tree here. And I'm not sure what editing uh, brought that in, but it's something I, I want you to watch for and be careful because it's just bright enough that it's standing out there and taking away a little bit about from this image. But this... This storm and those colors in there and that light is just absolutely amazing. I don't think, oh, you've cropped in already a little bit. That's part of the reason why. I don't, if we if we lose, um, I'm just curious, uh, you know, if we come in here, it's just not quite the same. I love the colors that are lighting up this lake as well. I just don't want as much foreground in there as well. So, nice. Uh, did Nancy have a question that I should be answering? What software recommend? Oh, do you recommend for stacking on a PC? Uh, I, on PCs, I think it's called uh, Sequitur. Uh, if you Google Windows uh, Star Stacking Software, that Sequitur is going to come up. We could try that in a minute if we want. So there we go. And I think Roy is collecting questions. And if I don't get your, oh yeah, he just said that. Thank you, Roy. Okay. That's what I got for you, Teresa. Let's move on. Kevin Walks got one more. Since this is your second, we're going to be a little bit faster. So I have more time to complain about Instagram. Um, Kevin, this is gorgeous. This is a really, really nice image. I like it. The barn is just so crisp and bright. The detail there is great. Uh, we have kind of a little hint of layers off in the distance, these soft clouds over top. There is a lot to like here think it's a very lovely image. I'm, I said I wasn't going to flip anything, but let's real quick just flip it for a second and look at it. So now my eye comes into this frame and wanders over this beautiful landscape before hitting the barn and then kind of coming back out. I don't know. Chat room, you let me know. What do you think? Flipped or non-flipped? I really very rarely. In fact, I think I can say pretty definitively, it's incredibly rare that I ever flip my own images. So I don't think about them too often. But whenever Steve or David suggest it, I go, hmm, yeah, that does look better. I can see why. We could argue that you maybe maybe you don't need quite as much behind the barn. We could come in and kind of use that tree as the, as the guiding point there. We could even come up a little bit from the bottom, um, somewhere in that vicinity. And you don't need to do sky replacement on this, but wouldn't it be nice if you could do uh, foreground replacement? I, I tell you, because the one thing it, that I, you know, that is a little, is the difference. We have this very green patch and then otherwise all brown. And that kind of fits. It feels like an old haying field or an old farm field, but when this green grass in here. So you might want to work on this and see if you can get it to be a little bit more uniform down there. But um, this this looks looks lovely. Looks like a nice little um, um, a painting. Looks like something you would paint. So Jeff said to flip it too. People don't like the flip. Um, oh, Teresa, you said the halo is from a boat coming from over there. Oh, interesting. Um, 
not flipped, flipped. Hmm. Seems kind of split, half and half. If you're watching this after the fact, you could leave a comment and say, do you like it flipped or not flipped? And kind of related to that, you know what you could do right now? You could give the show a thumbs up if you appreciate it. If you feel like I'm a little lonely, you give the show a thumbs up. If you feel like I'm providing helpful information, you give the show a thumbs up. If you like watching me take sips of my tea, you could give the show a thumbs up. We're going to talk about the Canon R3 and what I felt is the most exciting announcement in just a moment. But first, let's talk about um, a couple of things that I brought to Iceland that really made a difference. I am fairly organized when I travel. I have been traveling for a couple of years now with this little low pro wire um, kind of organizer. There is one of every kind of USB cable you could use here. A USB-C, a lightning cable. I don't own any iPhones, but you know what? On this trip, Steve needed it. Um, and I had it. He was like, you don't even own any iPhones. I said, I'm just that kind of guy. So I felt that was the first time I've ever needed it or anybody's used it, but I've been carrying it around. Then I've got the little weird, I can't remember what you call this guy. This is the USB, USB, um, B or micro mini. It's the one the old GoPros used and some other stuff uses. I have a little MyOps wireless remote that still uses this. And then I have the micro. That's the kind of, uh, you know, Android phones from last year or previous years. And then I've got a pair of wired headphones. Most of the time, if I'm shooting video, it's really nice to have headphones in. Don't just listen to the audio meters because sometimes the audio meters don't pick up static or other things that the mic might be picking up. Uh, and so it's really good to hear. So this is always in my camera bag, always. And it's very nice to know that I have a cable for whatever I want. Now, this little Temba bag, it's called Cable Duo 4. It actually has built into it these little spots um, for you to put cables in. This is the first trip that I brought this bag on. Uh, and I love its size. This is a super cheap and, I, and um, it's just some, my tape job is just embarrassing here, but it already felt kind of weak up there. So I taped it. Uh, but this is just a super cheap wired remote. Uh, why not wireless? Why not use the phone app? Because you can plug this in and you know it's just going to work every time. And it has just a button to make the camera take a picture. And it has the little slide lock to make the camera continue to take pictures uh, or take a very long bulb exposure. You know it's going to work. It's so nice to have this along. Why not the app? Because it takes you a minute to get connected. Sometimes it fails. There are times where I bring that app up and it crashes on me. That's really frustrating when the aurora is starting to happen and you want to do some you know, remote release. You can also do two second timer. That's what I've done for years in a lot of cases, just fire it. But it's nice to be able to make it take a picture exactly when you want to. And that is nice. So I like that. Uh, this is glow in the dark tape. So when it's hanging down below your tripod, you can easily see it in the dark. Also in here is a little USB battery. Always Steve needed to borrow this as well. Always with me in my camera bag so that I can charge my camera if I have to in a pinch if something's gone wrong or charge my phone or something like this. Um, and then this is another tool that I bought before the Iceland trip. Um, I felt a little pressure leading this trip. I wanted to be prepared for any necessary circumstance. And this little hex wrench from NovaFlex, I am pretty happy with. I often bring. I think it's in here in this little orange bag. I usually have a spare tripod plate along with this Leo photo tool that has three different hex sizes on it. It's got this little one that pulls in, pulls out. Um, and then it's got a flat head here. This is actually really important. Um, a bottle opener. I'm being sarcastic. I don't drink usually. So uh, especially beer that comes in bottles um, uh, and a little carabiner. This is almost always with me, but... I wanted a few more sizes, including the sizes or the little kind of star tool that you might find on some tripods. It also has a flat head. The only disappointing thing I can say about this is that it has a Phillips head too, which is great, but it's kind of puny. I wish it was a little bit more robust because there was something the other day 
that I needed a Phillips head for, and this was too small for it. But this was like 20 bucks, and it's really nice to always have those tools with me. I should put it in the orange bag along with this thing. I, you know, I really, um, the orange bag is nice, and there's batteries I keep in a green bag. Just, you see it in the camera bag right away. You go for it. You got it. You know what's in there. That's nice. And then actually, I just have a pen in here that also is a remote stylus. Didn't use this at all. And for some reason, I threw another hex wrench in there. So those things were nice. Also, what I brought on this trip um, that I don't have uh, within reach were filter wrenches because almost always somebody gets a filter stuck on something else. And filter wrenches, filter wrenches can be really, really nice for getting them unstuck. It didn't happen on this trip. You know why? Because I brought them and I was prepared. This first trip, I really brought them on. So no one got anything stuck. Speaking of filters, I'm a big fan of the Nissi system. And I tried out the MindShift filter hive, I think, or nest it's called. I think it's called the nest. All of my little Nissi filters are in here. And this uh, is a really nice way to keep all of it organized. It's kind of chunky though. It takes up some room. Steve on this trip, was trying the new Case Wolverine magnetic filters. Look at, the, there is almost the same filter uh, stuff in here that there is in here. And this is magnetic. There were times where I watched Steve just pop it on and off in half a second while I carefully screwed on the filter and then, you know, realized that I had started to screw it on the wrong way or, you know, it started to get jammed and I have to unscrew it. The speed with which you can use these is very nice. Plus magnets. Magnets are just cool. The way they stick together and stuff. The way it works is, and I'm going to do a separate video about this soon. Uh, you put the little adapter ring on. So this is a little adapter ring that is magnetic. And then the individual magnet filters, and it even comes with a little um, uh, magnetic lens. Uh, cover as well, lens cap, if you will. They just, oh, did you hear that? Let's put it up next to the microphone and make sure. And then it's stuck in there. So nice. Really, really nice. Um, not cheap. That's about 500 ish dollars. But look at the size of it and think about the speed with which you can change filters out in the field. Circular polarizer and a couple different indies of different strength in there. Now, I also brought the 12 to 24 with me. Um, I'm borrowing this. I wanted an ultra wide for this trip, and um, I wanted to be able to use filters on it. It's a bulbous front element with a fixed lens hood, which means you need that gigantic lens system, unless you use the rear filter holder. And that's what I have on this trip. And let me show you. Here they are. Here are four NDs of different strength in here. You see, kind of. Uh, and they go in and out in the back very, very easily. Upside, incredibly small, affordable, uh, very high quality. Downside, uh, you can't do a circular polarizer. And if you're trying to change these quickly out in the field, yep, you have to take the lens off. That's a little bit of a bummer. And if you're a ding dong like me and you accidentally drop it in the tall grass, well, you spend a few moments looking for the filter in the tall grass. So they are not perfect, but they are certainly a very um, viable option for using with wide angle bulbous front element lenses, which, you know, there are some very, very nice ones. But if you want to use filters on them, it is a huge expensive system that you have to Put. So I, I, I'm happy to recommend these to people who want a filter, but they come with some drawbacks or caveats. Last thing I'll talk about before we get to the Canon stuff and start to wrap the show up after questions is I brought the Air 2S with me. Uh, again, leading this trip, I did not have a lot of time to fly, uh, spending a lot of my time figuring out where we were going to go next and how much time we were going to spend there and helping people once we got there. But I'm really, really happy with this purchase. I've got no uh, issues. Uh, if you haven't been paying attention, I bought this to replace my Mavic 2 Pro or Pro 2 that went for a swim in salt water in Alaska earlier this summer. And uh, it does everything that the Pro did in a smaller, uh, more compact 
version. And although I didn't fly it around the volcano because that wind was insane, I did fly it on a day when the sustained winds were just a little bit over. I mean, they're right about 30 miles an hour. It was really windy. I got it out and people were like, wait, are you really going to take off? And I was like, yeah, I think it'll be fine. And it was, it was fine. I, I didn't fly it very far away from me and I didn't fly it, you know, downwind for a half mile and, and, and then expect it to come right back to me. But um, it stayed stable and it was, here's what you do. When it's a very windy day, you take off, you watch it hover for a minute, see how it, how it handles. Then start to fly it into the wind and make sure that it can make headway, meaning that it can go even against the way the wind is blowing. Um, and if it can, then you should be good if you don't fly it too far away. How the people get into trouble is they fly it too far away and then it tells them, hey, I'm far away and I need to start coming home before I run out of battery. And then you realize that it's having to do twice the amount of work to come back against the wind and then the battery dies before it gets to them and it falls out of the sky. That's how people uh, lose their job. So don't, don't feel bad for them. It's their fault. They're big dum-dums. Okay, let's talk about the little Canon R3 for a minute. And as I said, I haven't had my hands on it, uh, hands on yet. Uh, I watched the great guys at DP Review, Chris and Jordan, and Gordon Lang. Gordon has just been creating killer videos lately. If you want all of the details of the R3, he's got two two-part videos that really cover it in depth, including that IAF. But let's go take a, a few moments to look at some pictures of it, why I talk a little bit about it, and then uh, we decide how we feel. How do we feel? I think you should feel pretty good. Again, as I said at the opening of this, uh, this is kind of a, um, what do you say? You want to go small like that? Do we need to see me at all? I don't think so. Um, this this is this this is a pretty niche camera, a niche camera. Um, its price makes it a niche camera, and then of course the fact that it's twenty four megapixels um, and a big body. So it looks lovely. Canon ergonomics, maybe because I've been a Canon shooter many years ago, I still have a soft spot for Canon, but I think their ergonomics are just really, really nice. And the R5 and R6, I think are great cameras and the menu system is fantastic. And the customizability of those cameras is very, very good. This looks to be a lovely camera. I am personally not interested in it, not only because I don't shoot Canon anymore, but because it is bigger. And I just... Really, when I travel, like to have a smaller, more portable camera. I'm very happy with my Sony A1. And in fact, I even have decided that there's a couple different L brackets out on the market. Uh, small rig makes one, really right stuff makes another. That both They add a little bulk to the camera, which some people like because it feels a little better in the hand, balances a little bit better, maybe with longer lenses. But I'm really happy with just my small L bracket that I found from Kirk on here. And um, we can talk about that at some point in the future. But that's the, my point is to say, I don't mind the Sony A1 being small. I love that it can fit in a small bag and it has a lot of power to it. So something like the R3, if I still shot in the Canon world, I probably would not consider, uh, even though I spent about this same amount of money on the A1 um, because it's just a bigger, bulkier camera. But for portrait photography, or for, I'm sorry, for sports and wildlife, this camera seems really, really good. Fantastic sensor in there. Uh, some arguments about the value at, at 24 megapixels, that's, that's where all of these cameras have been for years and years and years. And that's where the Sony A9 cameras have been, which I think is in some ways is the most direct competitor to the R3. But I think Sony really changed the game some with having a, a Sony A1 that has all of the speed of the R3 but still providing 50 megapixel images. Um, and in fact, you do crop uh, with A1 and you're down at about 24, 21, I think, 21 megapixels. So that's something that, something to keep in mind. But what this camera has that so many people have been talking about for a long time and are really excited to see back in a Canon body is the eye control AF. You can look to activate focus points within this camera. 
And Gordon talks about that in depth. And he is very, very positive about it. And uh, uh, Gordon is a great guy. I think he's a great reviewer. He's a great photographer. And when he gets excited about something, I, I take notice because he is not um, he's not a hype guy. You know, he's not like, oh, this is the new best thing. If it's good, he tells you it's good. If it's not good, he tells you it's not good. And for him to say that this is working really well, and I believe he even called it a game changer, um, is impressive. So you can't use it to track moving objects, but you can use it to move your focus point around simply by looking, and then it will start tracking if you're in one of the tracking modes. Uh, so again, you know, I think the R5 is still going to be the camera for most people. It's fast. It's got incredible autofocus. But for those who need even more power uh, and are willing to pay for it, this R3 is, uh, is going to do well. It's going to do well. And it's just really impressive how much Canon has improved since their initial mirrorless, the EOS R launch. Um, the R5, R6, R3 all very, very nice cameras. This is, you know, this is pretty expensive. And when you put it up against something like the Sony A9, uh, it, it might not look as good, but this is Canon. They've got some great lenses to go with it. Plus, of course, with adapters, it's going to work with a huge lens selection that they have. Um, and I think people, the pros who shoot Canon are going to be happy with this. Early results, early reports on the image quality, which people have to be careful about because really the reviewers only have pre-production models right now, um, seem very, very good. So uh, it looks great. It looks great and is fast enough to use the electronic shutter without any kind of uh, worry about things. Uh, but here's what I find more exciting. Canon's got these great cameras, but they have, and they have fantastic R lenses on the market, but they don't have a lot of affordable lenses for the R system. And yes, you can use older lenses that are adapted, but you know, there are a lot of people buying into the mirrorless system that don't want to mess with adapters, feel like there's going to cause issues there. It's very unlikely with Canon lenses that there's going to be any kind of slowdown with adapters. But we have two lenses that were announced along with the R3. One of them is in 100 to 400. It is not the speediest lens in that at 400, you're out at F8, but it's just going to be 650. It is a lightweight, portable, you know, it's a friendly sized lens. The image quality, I suspect, is going to be excellent. Uh, and it's going to be just 650 bucks. And if you say, oh, F8, out of 400 that's terrible you have to start to change your mindset here because uh, these cameras the r5 r6 r3 you can go to very high isos without a whole lot of worry 3200 6400 and and yes if you are primarily shooting in low light conditions maybe a sports photographer doing night games or a wildlife photographer getting up early in the morning then this is probably not the lens for you but if you are just kind of a hobbyist and you want a lens, uh, this range for landscapes or wildlife, you know, in, in midday or at the zoo, uh, this is going to be a very lovely lens for you. And the fact that it's not going to break the bank is great. So I'm really excited to see Canon announcing things like this. The other lens is a very affordable 16 millimeter F2.8 just $299. Uh, it's tiny. It's going to be a good quality as well. Uh, and um, yeah, F2.8, it'd be, it'd be fun if it was a little bit faster. But this again is to satisfy folks that want some different focal lengths that don't break the bank, that fit nicely on the R5 and R6, which are a little bit more portable and, and friendly as size as well. So um, yeah. There you go. These lenses. And I want to see Canon release more of these. Steve now has um, an R5. Come back to me now. Um, and uh, he, we were talking about lenses, you know, it, they're expensive. He wants the 15 to 35, it's $2,400, uh, $2,399, I think. Maybe it's $2,299. Uh, and it's just nice to see this 16 is probably not, Steve is not going to use this to shoot real estate. Although I think 
I think it would be fine for that because a lot of times you're not shooting at f2.8, you're up at f8. And yeah, at, at f2.8, this more affordable STM lens isn't going to be the absolute sharpest, but I suspect it's going to be very, very nice. And for people looking for a small compact lens that gets in this focal range, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. So that's what I have to say about that. And I think um, we're getting close to wrapping the show up. Let me go see the Q&A documents if I'm missing anything from that. And uh, was there anything else that I was supposed to talk about? Ah, uh, Brian says, do not post pics on Facebook or maybe more so now with the issues on Instagram. That's a good question, Brian. Yes, I often post uh, on Facebook along with Instagram, but I wasn't consistent with it. And, um, uh, you know, Facebook is, is different for me because I also put up like my family vacation pictures on, on Facebook or some of, heaven forbid, my political beliefs on Facebook. And so that's all mixed together. It's not as great a record of my photography and the people on there. What I loved, what I loved about Instagram in the beginning and, and still for the most part now is that you choose who you follow. Yeah, yeah, that's true on Facebook as well. But I have so many high school friends on Facebook um, that it's it's less about people following me for my photography there and people following me because they knew me at different points in my life or coworkers and things like that. And it's fun to share with those people my pictures. But again, as I said, I share other things. So it's kind of a mix and a jumble. Whereas Instagram for me was focused photography. Here's this lovely picture I took in Death Valley. Here's this lovely picture I took in Iceland. In my opinion, lovely picture. Not everybody. It. So, um, so we'll see. Uh, Brian also wants to know my thoughts on the a seven four. Will I be getting it? He can't wait himself. Uh, so that's the a seven four that seems to be, uh, going to be announced soonish, uh, from the rumors. I don't know anything more. Um, September, October timeframe, about 30 megapixels, probably 4k 60 frames per second. Uh, not higher than maybe 6K, I think somebody said, but I don't know. Um, I think that's going to be a fantastic camera. It's going to be really nice. 30 megapixels is a sweet spot, I, I think. Definitely much, uh, definitely enough to to crop some. So wildlife photographers, I imagine its, uh, it's focusing system is going to borrow some from the A1 or the A9. Um, and uh, probably a little bit of a price increase, somewhere uh, closer to $24.99, I think. The R6 kind of set that bar a little bit higher, and so Sony's happy to go there too. Um, it's gonna. It looks like it's gonna be a lovely camera. I probably will not buy uh, because the A1 is now my main camera, and the A7R3 that I've been using for years and years and years is my backup camera when I travel. And just fun fact, the A7R2 is the camera that I use now for all of this video that sits here. And sometimes I forget to turn it off, and it sits there for days. Well, there was one time. For a whole long weekend, it sat turned on, and it's okay. It just keeps working until it doesn't. But um, that does the Sony A7 IV looks like a lovely, lovely camera. And um, at some point in the future, maybe I'll get it to replace one of my others. But for now, pretty happy with that. Anything else we should talk about? Oh, Delena wants to know Amazon for the magnetic filters. I'll tell you what, Delena, I will put in the pen group, and maybe I'll try to remember to put it below this video too, a link to those magnetic filters. I know they're on B&H. They're probably on Amazon as well. And um, they are, I, I can give them a thumbs up. If Steve was on the show, he would give them two thumbs up. I actually kind of had to pry them back out of his hands. This, these are a loan to me that I mostly let him use in Iceland. Um, that's right. Not only did I charge his phone for him, but I let him use really nice filter in Iceland. You would think that he would be more sympathetic about my Instagram account and not sit there at lunch going, I don't know if I can find a scooter with another good battery. That's how Steve talks when he's not on the show. You all think he talks like he does, but he actually talks in a really dopey voice. I can say these things because he's not here. So, all right. Brian says, uh, switch to Sony. You only have the A7S III and the A7 III, so this will fit in great. Sony for the win. Nice. Uh, yeah, you know, here's the thing. If you notice, there's a couple of reasons I'm making less videos these days. I thought about making a video about this, but most people don't care. But I'll tell, I'll tell you all this. I mean, part of the reason is I'm traveling a lot more. And I'm very happy to travel. I like that. In some ways, that's more fun than sitting here in the basement making videos. Um, in other ways, not as much. But... One of the other reasons I, I feel less compelled is that 
the, everything that's being released now is good. It might not be the best for you. There was when I started this channel, there were some really crappy lenses and cameras out there. There was stuff that I reviewed and I was like, no, oh, who, 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 who is this for? I can't figure out anybody that would find this to be a good value. And now we're at a point where it it's really hard to find something that is mainstream that isn't a good value for somebody out there. There is just a lot of great cameras and equipment right now. Um, and so most reviews I'm doing, I feel pretty positive and then I feel a little less compelled to do them. Maybe that's just what I tell myself because I'm traveling more, but we'll see. I'm going to make a video about the filter systems because I want to talk about the three different filter systems. And I think there's a lot of value in that, figuring out which one is best for you. Obviously, if you have a bulbous front element, um, these are going to be quite compelling. Uh, but for other folks, Nissi versus the case, uh, that magnetic is really hard to give up. The, the Nissi system gives you a little bit more flexibility. Um, but uh, geez, again, really impressive with uh, the case filter system there. And I'm going to do a video about Instagram because I have uh, a couple of tips. One, uh, I'm also, you know, I, I yeah, as I said, I didn't lose my pictures, but it is the kind of that record in the order with which I had posted them. That was just a lovely way to kind of look back over my time. Um, but I always put them in folders. And so I can pretty easily go back and find all of those. And they're already date added. And as I said, uh, the captions in their own in their own document as well. Often, although when I write the captions, I don't say what picture they're going to because I know because it's like temporary. I copy it and paste it. So I have all of these documents with random captions and I'm now figuring out which doc, which images they go to. It's not something I'm going to spend time doing. So. Oh, the last thing I'll say, um, and I, I hope to do a video about this at some point. The bag of choice for me for so long has been the Mindshift Backlight 26L. This is the bag for four years that I've been carrying around with me. And I was just starting to think about everything I needed to take to Iceland to be happy. And I finally upgraded to the 36L. And I have resisted for a while. We have a client that comes on some of our trips that has this. And I look at it on his back and I'm always like, oh, that looks huge. But excuse me. I'll tell you what, though. I'm really, really happy with this bag. Yes, it's big. Yes, you can put too much stuff in it. And yes, then your lower back can be unhappy as mine was uh, early on. Um, but I did a few stretching exercises and it got better. But the the... If you're careful about how you pack it, you have so much flexibility in putting things in and out. And I just really, I'm just really happy with that bigger bag. So don't poo poo the bigger bags. Not only that, you can put the gear you need in there, but it easily carries an extra jacket, uh, extra water bottles, things like that. So I recommend bigger bags so you have flexibility when you're traveling. And it's only like a pound and a half or two pounds more than the other bag. And that really, when it's on your back, you don't notice the difference. What you notice is when you pack it more. But I'm just repeating myself. All right. Jeremy just got back from Ketchikan with his F-Stop Loka that he's had for six years, 16 miles with it on his back. I know people love the F-Stop bags as well. And I like some of that kind of flexibility of uh, the other bags where you can uh, have the different cubes in them and stuff. But I just keep coming back to these back light bags from Mindshift. They're just great. I really enjoy them. And I think that's where we'll stop on that very positive note. No more complaining about Instagram. Who cares about them? All right. Appreciate you watching. Uh, Teresa said at the very beginning of the show that it feels like it's been a while since the show was on. Yes, it had. It had been almost a month. Uh, it won't be as long until it's on again, but I won't be here next week. I'm taking the kids uh, and Chris to Hawaii. I'm very excited about this quick little family vacation. So I will be out of the office on Wednesday, but the next Wednesday I will be back here. Maybe I'll be by myself. Maybe I just want to do this show by myself forever now. Probably not. I'll have somebody on with me. Don't worry. Thanks so much for watching. Everybody have a great day. Don't forget to hit thumbs up if you haven't already. Bye-bye.